morning. I think it's still morning, right? Can you hear me okay in the back? Excellent. All right, I'm Jane LeClaire. I am the president of the Washington Center for Cybersecurity Research and Development, and also work on uh, the board with uh, cybersecurity at Thomas Edison. And today we've got a great panel uh, with us to talk about government this time. And we've already co covered some of the kind of interesting topics, I think, that kind of tied in between government and industry. But I think we're going to expand on that even, even more. When we talk about cyber trends, we're going to talk about a little bit more on workforce issues. And we're going to hit some of those educational initiatives as well. And I know some of the questions that people had were, what do we have in the area of government and uh, educational initiatives, as well as women? Uh, and how do we get more people in? And so I think some of our folks are also going to talk about some different ways to get women into the field, which has been a difficult thing, as we most everybody who's in cyber knows already. So there's some new ideas out there. There's some new things working in the works and getting in progress. So we'll talk about those as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists today. To start off with uh, David Tillman and David, William David. <laughs> um, is currently the Cybersecurity Director for the Department of the Navy. So thank you for being with us. You. You've got some really interesting topics on, on workforce as well as education, so we're excited to hear about that. Bill Newhouse is with us, and Bill is the Deputy Director of uh, NICE. So thank you, Bill, for being with us. And uh, again, great issues that you're going to talk about with us. And then uh, we have Joe. Jar Jarzembeck, how'd I do, good? Yes. All right. Um, he's the director for government aerospace and defense programs with Synopsys, and you're full of questions, so we're gonna have to keep you right in there, okay, Joe? <laughs> <Sometimes>. <laughs> and last with us is Emil Manette, and Emil is the lead for DHS Cyber Supply Chain Risk Management Initiatives. So thank you for being with us as well, and I know uh, it's, it's really good to hear a different focus from government this time, and I think we've got some new ideas. So we'll start off, each person will talk about 10 minutes about the topics that they're most interested in sharing, the newest areas, and then after that we'll take questions from everybody. And I think uh, Dan has the microphone, so he'll help us with that afterwards. So Dave, if you would start, that'd sure, be great. Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, so basically, uh, I've come to share today uh, some of the uh, cybersecurity workforce initiatives that the Department of Navy and Department of Defense writ large are uh, engaged in. And one of the major ones, some of you may have heard or not heard, there's going to be a cybersecurity accepted service, which is a new personnel system in DOD, uh, much, uh, much like the uh, intelligence personnel system, where there are more agile hiring uh, capabilities. So for those of you that uh, I heard a couple questions in the back about veterans hiring and other workforce hiring, how do we get in? Uh, the agile hiring capabilities are if you know somebody or you don't know somebody, you wanna just submit a resume for someone to look at, uh, they will and they have the ability to do direct hire based upon this, this new authority. Uh, some of the other things that we're trying to do because we can't compete from a salary perspective with uh, many of the large companies. Uh, for instance, the, uh, you know, the salary levels are too high or the perks are, are just out of line. Uh, what we are able to do now is we've increased the step grades in the various pay grades for GS employees from step 10 as being the highest to step 12 all the way from GS 1 through GS 15. And uh, we're using retention bonuses to try to hold really key talent and skill areas uh, on board by offering them up to half of their salary as an annual retention bonus. And for many of you, that seems like a lot, but it still does not compete with a FireEye or a Google or an Amazon. So uh, then they meet me and I, I sell them on the mission. The next thing uh, I probably w would like to, uh, to share today would be the uh, I'm, I've just met with the, Na the Virginia Secretary of Education and I'm trying to start uh, an adoption of elementary schools to do what I call cybersecurity Head Start, much like the Head Start program early in the 60s that's, that gave kids a, a leg up. Uh, I'm attacking now not at the high school or you know, seniors in high school to sophomores in college, but looking at fourth and fifth graders and much like robotics competitions, having National Guard organizations and service organizations adopt schools and partnering with industry to adopt 
top schools and create this capture the flag activity across the country um, using basic skills and then growing them, uh, uh, pushing MITRE and others who have built our cybersecurity range to build ranges in, on the last mile. Many of us have access to um, magnet schools and you know the Beltway area and even New York and New Jersey large schools that are technology focused. I'm trying to take it to places like BFE Virginia, you know, uh, Danville and Lebanon and towns you've never heard of, Westmoreland County, where they are underserved and uh, focusing on girls, focusing on, on uh, the disenfranchised and focusing on the kid that just wants to break into his mom's car because that's the kid I want. Um, <laughs> And so that's, those yeah. are two of the major areas I'll be covering. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit, because I know you and I had talked about mm -hmm. it before, some of the different things that you might do with the competitions to draw in different people so it would be a little more open, as well as you mentioned the Girl Scout Initiative. Absolutely. So, so the Girl Scout Initiative, and we're focused on, on uh, really reaching out and having an, uh, the adoption occur and then uh, creating a focus on girls that are that is not just you know how you hear girls and women communicate differently yeah 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 I'm from Mars you're from Venus I get it but I really want to kind of break down that barrier and, and help teaming and, and uh, uh, reaching out and 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 uh, using um, women and executives in the government and in these companies to speak to these children at the elementary school and the junior high school level for so a girl can see uh, like the the leader of all of cyber for the U.S. Navy, ship Navy, is, is a three-star admiral and she's a doctor of physics. And so imagine how, what an elementary girl, uh, elementary school girl could look up and say, hey, I could do that. And that's really how we're trying to reach out. Also, uh, people of color going out and saying, hey, I, I'm the, look at me. I'm the director of the Department of Navy Cybersecurity. Good God. Right. I don't look like a lot of these guys right. that are in this field, right? Okay. So uh, the average guy is, doesn't look like me. He's 50 years old and has silver hair. I have gray hair. So it's a little bit right. different, right? Right. Great. And, and numbers there are so low, 10% to 6%. That's so that's right. That's really great to, to help in all those areas. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Bill? So uh, I'm Bill Newhouse from NIST, and NIST has a, a, a general process by which the guidance and, and guidelines and the standard documentation that we create, and the standards are generally for the federal government's use uh, by, by statute, that that's a consensus-based process, that we, we reach out and, and work to develop the publication in a consensus process and then actually put it out for public comment and adjudicate those comments. And so we hope over time we've built sort of a, a national trust. Our, 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 our director for NIST, who's also an undersecretary for commerce, because that's the department we're part of in the federal government, he, he likes to say, or the previous one, I, I haven't quite checked with a new one, but that we are the nation's laboratory and that we provide the, the, the foundational laboratory processes, the guidance, the guidance document, and places to come so that we can enable our economy to grow and do good things. And so bringing that, that foundation into what I do as the deputy director of NICE has been important. Um, we, by statute for NICE, we're tasked to develop a strategic plan. and and. Good, the good news is the things that David just described are described within that strategic plan. The, the first goal being let's, let's get more people into cybersecurity as, as fast as we can because I think we just heard a whole bunch of industry people say they need more people. That We, we, we see that there are, um, there's a cyberseek.org, cyberseek.org website that's been created that, that has some numbers that say about 300,000 job vacancies are kind of out there right now in, in this space. So how do we get people engaged? Uh, there are obviously challenges because if, if we don't have entry-level positions and we train a lot of people, are we running them up against a door that isn't quite open? Uh, we need to think about that. But that, that acceleration of it is, is one of the strategic goals. The second one is diversity and, and diversifying not only the people who come into the cybersecurity work and, and education, but to figure out is there diversity of thought that we haven't been using for the last 20, 25 years as we've moved from computer security, information security, information assurance, and now into this cybersecurity for, for our cyberspace conversation. And, and so, yeah, diversity, create opportunities, let's tap into communities of people who, who haven't been told and don't know that there's a, a, an educational path for them, and then they don't know yet that there's a, a work path for them, and let's, let's get that message out. And, and obviously events like this are, are part of that too. So we're the stewards of this, this large idea that we hope lets you run with the scissors ne necessary to push on our nation's needs. You, you are part of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. It's not this national initiative. It's not 
Don CIOs, Department of Navy CIOs, it's not DHS, it's not Synopsys, it's all of our, our, our national need to be expressed and worked on. The third strategic objective in that space is that, yeah, we have a workforce, let's, let's do all the right things to make that workforce understand the mission it's focused on, make sure they're trained the best to do it, let's be agile and figure out how to, how to bring reskill people into that workforce. And so what are all the workforce management, workforce development things that have to happen? Um, you can imagine that a, a good foundation on that might be to describe cybersecurity work. And, and, and we started doing that just about a decade ago. Uh, the federal government took on the, a notion of a comprehensive national cybersecurity initiative. And it started off as a super, super secret spooky thing that we should focus on within government to make sure we're ready to deal with the cyberspace challenge. And it, by the time the Obama administration came along, the policy review of it said, no, no, let's make this a public thing. And, and NICE, the national initiative, popped out of, instead of let's just work on the federal workforce, let's work on the nation to prepare them to be, to be the the, you know, to get our, our workforce you know, all across the nation to do this well. So in starting it a decade ago, there were people who said, we need to describe cybersecurity work. And, and the first thing they did is ask people, what, what's the work that you do? And that's maybe a backwards looking thing because there's a lot of work we have never done in cybersecurity or aren't doing enough of that might not be described in that model. But it categorized the work into seven categories. It took that and broke it down into some subcategories, and now we've got 52 work roles. And, and, and David, you did, you did a real nice job, sorry, Dan, excuse me, did a nice job of describing that we have 52 work roles that you can grab any one of those work roles to describe who you are and your position or your job in cybersecurity. Now, Joe's been asking lots of questions on the microphone, and he asked lots of questions when we've been around each other, uh, kind of like, what's the right thing to do, Bill? What, you know, I want to do something. I want to make a difference. And, and this framework is common lexicon. The, these 52 work roles have a lot of uh, minutia around them that are called knowledge, skill, and ability statements, and then tasks that we think the people in those work roles do. Um, that's a lot of stuff to, 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 to play with, but it is a common lexicon that we can all borrow from. And so, so if, if, if somebody says, I want to start something, they, they, can, they can use this as a reference point. I, I showed a group last week that you can search up into the framework. And so if you wanted to inspire a, a student, even at the elementary school level, to sort of say, what's something you imagine a cybersecurity person does? And they can come up with a task statement like, uh, you know, do they, do they penetra you know, do penetration testing? So you can type the word penetration testing into this one resource we have, and it'll show you the work roles that are related to that. So now you've created a moment for that student, that skill changer, to say, maybe that's something I want to do. Okay, well, it'd be great if the next thing it did, it says if people you know, in this work role might have gotten their training from these places. They might have gone to you know, Thomas Edison State University. They might be taking your online program. They might be just showing up at a community college and taking one class. They might go to one of the certification uh, providers and taking a training class that helps you get ready for a test. So now you create a journey, a little moment that they can walk through. And, and so this foundation, this NICE framework is something that I, I, I grabbed onto once, once NIST became involved with NICE, which was, was essentially eight years ago. But in the last year and a half, we got it pu published and it's being used in different places. The federal government has to do an assessment of all our workforce to say that you do cybersecurity work. And in doing that, we'll know more about ourselves. We might not know the right things yet, but we'll know more. And so it becomes a, a foundation. It's sort of a chicken and egg. If I can get people to go to the framework early, I think it opens up the dialogue. We can start to measure this workforce better. We can start to understand our needs. I think most of you could justify the work you're doing is already right in this nice cybersecurity space. The other thing I ask of you as a nation is to say, look, you codified this into a framework. Can, can can I, can I add some stuff to it? I think it's missing. It doesn't have a, a task statement that I do in my job that I think is vital to cybersecurity. And, and to refine it, you know, we, we, we heard some of the previous panel people talk about the need to uh, have the basic skills and competencies that let you bit function in business. Those are listed in the framework. How, eventually, we might want to have some sort of tier structure. If you've, who's, who in this room has ever used 853? Security and privacy controls. It's a it's a big document. It says if you if you think about all these things, you 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 might have coverage of all your needs, and and it, 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 when it first came out, it didn't have the high level, high, medium, and low kind of these are the ones that you need to worry about most. The nice framework doesn't have that yet. It doesn't have a hierarchy to say one thing is more important than the next. Individually, at the NERC level, the energy, different sectors need to work on that. So. 
I'm going to I'm going to move from that. My other role at NIST is to be at a place where we build reference architectures. We we try to take commercial gear. We definitely take commercial gear. Let me say it that way. We get the companies to bring it to us that have the technology already instantiated with standards built into it that may not be implemented to their fullest level. And we document that if you improve the use of the standards that are already in place that you can raise the bar in cybersecurity and we demonstrate how easy it might be for you to copy that reference inf implementation into your, into your infrastructure. So we're giving you a, a head start and maybe uh, for your students a, a place to, to read through a whole new NIST special pub and kind of go, cool, that's me. I understand it. it. We describe that work in terms of the cybersecurity framework for critical infrastructure. And, and that one has the, these big verbs, identify. I heard everybody on the panel before who says, I need to identify my value, my critical value assets. Identify, detect. I need to know what's going on in my systems. Detect, identify, detect, protect. You know, what are you taking, what steps are you taking to protect those two things you just decided you're going to defend and, and identify as needing to be defended? And then respond and recover. Vital things that I heard the, the previous panel say they, they know they need to focus on. So I've given you some verbs. NIST has, has developed this framework by asking the industry and the critical infrastructure sector to, to help. You know, it wasn't a NIST thing. Here it is. Here's the ten things. It was NIST going out and finding out that these are the five verbs that really describe the space. Then they break it down into categories. And then the subcategories are positive outcomes. If you've done this, you have control of knowledge of, of all your assets. You have knowledge of all this stuff. And if you can start to answer that question a little bit, you start to then understand the workforce you need. And, and in those publications at this Center of Excellence we've created, it's the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, these reference architectures tell you which subcategories are being addressed. And then now I take that nice framework and I put it next to it and I say, and here are the people's descriptions of the work roles of the people who could help you do that. And so I think what I've got is a lot of stuff for you to read, but I also, it's stuff for you to feed back into and let us know that we're getting it close and, and our goal is to promulgate all this stuff out. How, how much, you said seven to yeah, ten Yeah, you're, you're pretty good. Um, uh, the one, one last point minute. within NICE is we've created, we've created a, a public-private working group structure. <laughs> um, any of you can join once, once a month on a call that focuses on K through 12. So, you know, we want, I want you to come and tell us yeah. about this uh, Head Start program so that the other K through 12 members from all over the country who are all over the different parts of, of, of that sector hear it. We have competitions. So to do, do we have competitions that attract young girls into it? You kind of touched on that thing. Do, what, what is the mental model that, that lets somebody walk into a sport like cybersecurity? Let's say it's a sport. And, and if we say it's a sport, have we immediately eliminated 25 to 40 percent of our kids who don't want to play sports or something like that? Mm -hmm. So how do you figure out the diversity of that? So we have a competition subgroup. We have a, a collegiate one focused on what kind of you know, things that TSU and others can do, TESU can do. Um, and, and together, you, bring, you come to these and you volunteer if you want to, you listen a lot, you hear about all the stuff that's going on, workforce management's in there, and then uh, we just recently added apprenticeships, so I think I heard a little bit of the need for this apprenticeship model. You can bring people, promise that you're going to take them on as employees and send them into a curriculum area that you know you value, and software assurance is one area that we learned about most, most recently. Gary Shashagiri has set that up. So anyway, you can Google NICE and NIST and you can find all these resources, and, and, and I hope you come to play with us. Thanks. Thanks, Bill, and I'm sure we will have lots of questions yep. on that afterwards. I got, I got lots of answers about other people's great work. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Joe, can you, can you go Hi. for it? Yes, and I spell cybersecurity with, as one word, yep. except, uh -oh. I, and, and actually this is something we, we were challenged with when we stood at the National Cybersecurity Division and then started the Office of Cybersecurity and Communication. It's like, well, what do we do? So the standardization was when cybersecurity is just used as a word, it's a single word. But when it's used as an organizational title, it's two words. And by the way, other nations have actually adopted that as their way of doing it. I look at Singapore, it's just many have done that. So if you see that in two words like that, uh, uh, that's a nit. Joe, just to jump in, I was just reading because once Dan brought it up, we had to all check, right? <laughs> American English, British English, that's the other piece of it. Ah, that's true. I, I, so. Just about to throw that in ways. the mix. Right. I do. Yes. And, and, yeah. and yet but I'm, see, that's a framework. It's not the organization. And I'm co-chair of an interagency body that's CS. Yeah. So C it's it's cybersecurity. But that's an organization. Too. When it's used in an organizational title. So that's a nit. And, and yes, I ask a lot of questions, but you'll notice, that yeah, while I'm not a lawyer, it's, it's, I'm not leading the witness, but I've learned by serving on independent expert program reviews, it's far more important that you elicit the response from people rather than giving them the answer. Yep. And, and that's Makes the only sense. reason for doing that. I, I have tended to want to focus on the external dependencies. Look, 
I, I'm retired as an Air Force officer, and then I, I came in to, to industry, but then was asked to come back into government with working in the Pentagon, but then after 9-11, asked to come in Department of Homeland Security. I was one of the first 30 of the people in the National Cybersecurity Division that is now mushroomed into multiple organizations. Uh, we've been working, on, it's always been looking at these external dependencies. Uh, because we as a society, not just enterprises, but individual users, rely on many others to provide the capabilities that we rely on that are often cyber enabled. And more particularly, it's software enabled in what they do. And what we have to understand is that uh, the role of due diligence, due care, and cyber hygiene, that includes prevention. That should be done at all levels to be able to do that. One of the things I appreciate the opportunity of doing, I, I go and lecture at different universities, both graduate and undergraduate, and I always end up asking the, the students, because typically those audiences are the technical side, I said, how many of you program? Everybody raises their hands. I said, so how many of you, when you're programming, have ever disabled a compiler warning flag? They raise their hands. And see, some of you are out there in the audience, what's that? But if you're a programmer, you do understand it. And when I explain to them, we've worked with the compiler vendors that Compiler warning flags are all about security. And developers often get annoyed by those, so they disable them. And when they said, well, I didn't deliberately insert vulnerabilities or exploitable weaknesses into your, the system that I deployed, I said, did you disable a compiler warning flag? That's a deliberate act. You may not have understood the consequences of it, but it's all about the risk to the user. And they were unaware of that. So it's, it's like helping people understand that. We talk about co teaching students to code. Well, that's like teaching uh, surgeons to cut without teaching them hygiene. We understand that now in practice, surgeons know you've got to wash your hands. The hospitals force them to do that. So, it, but we will take somebody who has programmed, they've learned how to program, no cyber hygiene, just will de develop something and we'll de de deliver it and we'll accept it. But we're not thinking of that then. But we, if we actually instill that as a discipline, all the way down through that supply chain, we make a difference in that. And so we're, we're seeing that you can actually do preventative measures. You can test for this. And, and part of that is it actually comes down to also understanding what we can actually do uh, it, in terms of rather than taking a victim mentality of saying we can be more proactive. Because we've, we found that often it's not about the ingenuity of the hackers or those who are attacking, but it's more fundamentally about the vulnerabilities of the victim organization. And we can enumerate that across the board. So how can you get out of the victim mentality and actually be more proactive? Well, part of this is how do you buy things? When you buy things, have you ever asked questions about from of your suppliers? Have you checked before you accept it and put it into your approved products list. Do these products have known vulnerabilities? Do they have exploitable weaknesses? Do they even have malware? And, and I find out everyone who does these approved products lists, these assessed and cleared products lists, whatever you want to call it, they don't check for that stuff. It's almost like fancy marketing brochures were used to put it onto the, the approved products list. We, we have a responsibility in our organizations because that's our last line of defense. And, and so we can actually be more proactive about that. And when, when we do that, we could say, in many smaller organizations, they said, but I don't have the fundamental capabilities of being able to test these products. Well, that's where I could turn to, did you use independently tested and certified products? For years, I'd been saying, Dan's very familiar with this, I kept saying, we need a UL-like certification for software. Well, before I retired from the Department of Homeland Security, we started working with the Underwriters Labs. They now have the Cybersecurity Assurance Program. And we started with medical devices, we started with industrial control systems. And they're, they're now moving out into other fields where you can do that. And you know who's going to start driving the uses of this? Is insurance. Because as said, bad things are going to continue to happen, but insurance companies are going to ask, you had the right to choose, Mr. Enterprise Owner. Did you choose wisely? Did you choose to purchase and deploy something that was independently tested and certified, or did you buy for Joe's Garage Shop? You understand the difference here in your insurance position to be able to do that. So it's about focusing not just on cyber insurance, but cybersecurity assurance. And, and that balance is very important, and I know you've talked about that. Thank you very much. Emil? Good morning. Emil Monette with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, thanks for having me, first thanks of all. Um, I, wanna, I wanna tell you a little about, bit about what I'm doing at DHS. Uh, I kind of followed in Joe's footsteps took 
a couple years to hire me into that job, and that I think relates to some of the things I've heard here this morning about uh, the challenges of, of you know the workforce and, and uh, education and training. And I'm not I'm a technological immigrant. I'm I'm a I'm a criminal justice major with a law degree who's now a cybersecurity professional. So you know there is no linear path to to here. Um, what I am doing at DHS relates somewhat to what Joe is talking about, uh, is that I am establishing a new program. Uh, the, the new leadership uh, with our secretary uh, and the undersecretary and the assistant secretary whom I work for in the office of cybersecurity, spelled as two words, and communications, and I still, you know, even as an attorney, I'm not sure, and now it's an organization, and thanks, I was enlightened. Uh, have, uh, the, the new leadership has recognized that um, we have a serious problem with, with the information and communications and Internet of Things uh, supply chain. And, and what the problem is, and Joe kind of touched on this a little bit, is you know, we all have these wonderful things that we buy for cheap, reasonably cheap, uh, that make our lives better. And we carry them around, and I, I heard earlier, you know, well, how do they know that it's going to take me 12 minutes to get to the tunnel? or three hours to get to the tunnel. Uh, they know because these things are emitting all kinds of information. We don't really know where that information is going a lot of times. We don't know how much information is going out of these things that we use a lot of times. Uh, and generally, you know, if you think about your enterprise as a bubble, we focus our cybersecurity practices on the things that are in our enterprise. We're not necessarily concerned with the things that are in that pipeline of what's coming into our enterprise. And so we're introducing new risk into our enterprise every time we plug something in that we don't know whether it has uh, known vulnerabilities or weaknesses in it, it because it hasn't been tested because nobody asked, right? Lots of good, lots of this information communications technology and IoT is, is made to sort of the highest standards that, that industry has right now. And we don't really have a way of recognizing that, at least in the federal pro procurement community. Um, the goal, therefore, of my, of my new office, we call it an initiative right now uh, because we don't have funding yet. Uh, that's one of those government things. Um, is the, the goal, the vision, if you will, is to enable our stakeholders, uh, and, and DHS in this, in this realm has a very broad and diverse set of stakeholders. It's, it's the federal departments and agencies, the state, local, and tribal and territorial governments, and critical infrastructure owner and operators. So we touch all layers of government, and we touch a significant portion of the private sector. Uh, so the, the vision is to enable those stakeholders to become smarter consumers of things that are connected. And a primary way that we're going to do that is by sharing information about the risks that are inherent to the supply chain of these things uh, and mitigations for those things. So some mitigations are going to look like, hey, I'm going to buy something. I need to ask some questions of that seller, of that manufacturer. Sometimes it will be, hey, I'm going to buy something and I need to configure my own operations in a certain way so that I don't necessarily have to know every last thing about that thing that I'm plugging in. Uh, it's going to vary. You know, those mitigations are going to vary from end user to end user, and I think Joe kind of touched on this a little bit, and I'm stealing stuff that I've learned from, from him over the years. Um, the, the amount of security that we, or supply chain security, that we need in a given uh, item, whether it's hardware, software, IoT, really is very dependent on the end use. And so that end user risk tolerance becomes sort of our, our compass point for how we define mitigations. Uh, and what I, you know, what I mean by that, an example, a simple example, is that you know, I could buy a copier, or whatever we call them these days, a multifunctional printing device, and put it in the hallway out here uh, in the Hyatt, uh, and it would be used as the, in, in the business center, right? I could buy that very same machine and put it in the hallway at uh, the National Security Agency, for example. Those two items, although they're performing exactly the same function and they are identical items, have vastly different risk profiles because of that end user risk tolerance. And so as we develop our program uh, and, and work together with our stakeholders to identify the best ways to collaborate to generate some, some standards for mitigation and, and raise the floor, 
uh, because that's where that's really where we are going in this space. Um, th that end user risk tolerance is kind of our our north pole, if you will. I do want to touch on a couple things that I heard the other panelists uh, mention, and that's the luxury of sitting at the end of the table, right? Um, on on the workforce side. Uh, Mr. Tillman at the end here mentioned that uh, the Navy has a cyber workforce uh, initiative in the accepted service. DHS has a, a very similar thing. Uh, my office, uh, we have what we call cyber pay. That cyber pay is essentially a retention bonus, similar to what, so to what you were describing. Uh, and and we, we haven't gotten to the 50% mark yet. We're, we're, at, we're at about 25% uh, if, you have, if you have certain um, Credentials, right? So it's a you know whether it's a CISSP or, or sometimes even a PMP, depending on the position. Uh, but that that cyber pay program is now transitioning into something that will be accepted service, so a different type of civil service. Um, and the way that is being positioned is to attract people that might not want to do a career in the federal government, right? Maybe you want to come to DHS cyber to learn some new stuff at the beginning of your career that will enable you to use that as a stepping stone to go on to get a job you know across the river over here making making the big bucks uh, that's great we want you one and we don't necessarily need to provide you with the the retirement benefit and and some of the uh, even in some cases the health care benefits um, there's, so there's going to be an adjustable benefits package that kind of goes with these positions so that we can offer you a higher salary out of the front, but you, you don't have to have that sort of you've got to stay here for 20 years and get vested kind of, kind of thing to reap the full benefit of, of being there. So that's, that's on the workforce side. Um, DHS has a, has a lot of uh, recruiting events around, around the country. Um, we are always looking for uh, cyber professionals. And again, you don't, you know, I, I use myself as an example. You, it's not necessarily that you have to be somebody that's a programmer that, you know, knows five computer languages and, and has uh, a, a dozen credentials in that space. Um, there's lots of ways to, uh, to get to work on, uh, on, on what you think are cool or interesting uh, subject matter areas in cybersecurity. Uh, I will touch on CNCI since uh, this comprehensive uh, National Cybersecurity Initiative. One of the 11, was it 11? I think it was 11. Yep. Number 11, uh, the initiative number 11 under CNCI was supply chain risk management. So this idea that we've got a new start at DHS is kind of what I've been calling um, or describing anyway as this Sisyphus rock that a number of us have been pushing up and then chasing down the hill for a number of years. Now that rock has become polished and we've got lots of people, it's become the new shiny object. We've got lots of people running in to touch it, right? <laughs> we've got, we've got uh, multiple committees in Congress that are writing legislation about supply chain risk management. Uh, we've got lots of interest at the political leadership level in the federal government. I, actually, the, the, the Secretary of Homeland Security is out talking about supply chain risk management, cyber supply chain risk management in particular, uh, which, is, which is a sort of benchmark event. I, you know, I've been working in this space for a long time, and I've never heard a cabinet secretary talk about supply chain risk management because it's just not sexy. But this is the year supply chain got sexy in Washington, yeah. D.C. Okay. Dan, is wait, Dan is waiting for that. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Good? Yes. All right. Good Thank you so much, everybody. I'd, I'd just yeah, like to add, because I know a lot of organizations saying, well, how do I get started on that? There's actually guidance from NIST. We actually did this as an interagency activity on supply chain risk management. It's uh, Special Pub 800-161. There's a lot of guides that will take the 800-53 controls but put a su supply chain lens on that. So it's, it's one way that you're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. It may seem overwhelming if you're not, but it's got a lot of great guidance, including how do you deal with your suppliers, both pre-source uh, selection, post-source mm -hmm. selection? So it's a great start. Good. Thanks. Okay. I know I've got lots of questions, but let's start out in the audience first. Uh, who has the first question? Here. I think it's right over Down there over to your left. Yep. Thank you. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, sorry about the uh, my voice here. I'm still working on a cold, but I think this question goes to Mr. Tillman. So as of January 1 of this year, uh, all DOD contractors are supposed to be compliant to uh, uh, this 800-171, and it's a flow down requirement. So uh, even at the tier three and four, um, people are supposed to be compliant if uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, CUI, uh, controlled and classified information. My question is, uh, uh, do you foresee any uh, uh, formal certification for the uh, uh, companies that are in, in the uh, supply chain that deal with the uh, CUI to attest that they are uh, 171 compliant? So the simple answer to your question is no, and I happen to be the uh, the guy that's going around training all the contract officers too on that. So the uh, the actual deal is when you sign that contract, you attest that you will uh, conform to the requirements that are in the uh, in any of the appendices around cybersecurity. The challenge is the government still has a very um, short-sighted and compliance-oriented view of what that means and thinks that we should dictate to the small business, and that's not the case. It's, it's not a problem, and I want, to ensure, I want to tell any small business owner out here, don't go out and hire a 3PAO because we're not interested in you coming back and saying, they say we're, we comply with 800-171, we're not requiring that, and it's not something that you need to do. What you need to do is look at what adequate security means for the data that you're storing and make sure that you're exercising diligence around that. And it, just like it's been said earlier, you're gonna get hit. When you get hit, report, report, report. Thank you. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about students, and which I think is fantastic. If I could turn the clock back 32 years, uh, I'd be in good shape. So, um, people, get, people get involved in cybersecurity. Um, I was actually 40, I was in IT, and I'm like, you know what, I don't care if your monitor doesn't work anymore. I need something new. And I got into IT security. So can you be owned and out of shape like me and get involved in one of these programs? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, part of it's it's a mindset about, it's almost you want to tell people, if you think like a hacker, you would fundamentally understand there's a huge role on the defense side for cybersecurity, and you'll be much more successful in that. And you don't have to actually have all the technical skills, but just to be able to start asking questions organizationally, what are we doing about this? I, I will just add that, indeed, youth and exuberance is no match for old age and treachery. <laughs> I guess uh, let me let me throw a little piece of that question in. Not just talking about getting the education, but getting the job. I think that's what people are worried about, that they take their time at a certain right. point in their life to put in the education or get the certifications, but can they get the job then? It's, it's chicken egg a little bit, right? Because mm -hmm. you know we can say it all day long, it's the right thing to do, and it's even in the new federal management plan. We, we want to reskill federal workforce that are doing potentially things that we don't necessarily want to need to focus on as much and, and move them in. So, so what's the, you know, what, what agencies have developed, which processes, and maybe you have, you have at least one kind of in, in, in hand. What I see is when community colleges come to, to visit me at the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, they're your age. And, and, and the students are, you know, they're, they're, they are making that mid-career choice. And what they do is, is they look at, at the 8570 certifications and they, and they see, and you can look at CyberSeq as a, as a job kind of mapping to training thing. The, it'll, it'll list the certifications that are most relevant. And, and often you can find you can take a single course at your local community college. And down where I live, they just said those might be free if you're at a certain age group. And, and maybe we need to push it to make it so it's the career reskillers too. So, so you know, what NICE would like to do is be able to say in front of a bunch of audiences, here's five different kind of programs and look how they're working. And so that inspires seven more. And, and, and I don't have them off, always off the top of my head, but that's, that's, that's part of the conversation. So. I'd, I'd like to speak to the 8570. So the Navy has gone ahead and gotten rid of certifications as a requirement for the workforce. And we're leading DOD. So DOD is rewriting the 8570 to actually uh, not require certifications anymore. However, all of you that are small business or business consultants to the government, you won't be relieved of that requirement until around 2022 because that's how long it takes to change the FAR, right, the Federal Acquisition Regulation. So we're going to education, training, and experience, 
And I'm pushing for a guild-like organization to be established across the federal government, starting in DOD, where we are doing apprenticeship journeymen and master-level um, adjudications, and folks will eventually grow into uh, a community of interest and practice that, that aligns itself with, like, lawyers and doctors, right? Craftsmen that uh, are doing, doing the job and are, are accredited by each other. Uh, and, and having these skills, much like the uh, old watch standards on Navy ships. Very good. So if I can just add sure. that, um, you know, not all of the jobs in cybersecurity, whether it's spelled with two words or one, uh, are technical right. jobs, right? right. And, and that's kind of why I use myself in, as an example. There's lots of, the, cybersecurity touches every aspect of how we live and do business today. So there's lots of jobs in policy and governance and, and business operations where, you know, you're going to need to know something about cybersecurity. I've learned enough about cybersecurity to, like, play buzzword bingo or something. But, you know, I know, how, I know that from my, my previous discipline of, of law and, frankly, government contracts that I know how to apply that cybersecurity to that federal procurement space and to that legal space and vice versa. Right, and that's the that's the real value that I bring to the to the fight, is that I've got a different perspective on it because I come from that different discipline, and so the, there is there is a need for lots and lots of us from lots of different places to make this actually a winnable fight. If I can give one 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 possible example, and, and I don't have proof this is happening yet, but with the nice framework, you've got you've got the ability for you as a person who says you're doing information security already to look into the framework and then tell somebody you want to work for, I'm already able to do these things. Those knowledge, skill, and ability statements, I, I can express to you that I have that knowledge because I, I've been doing these tasks and they're in these work roles. The, the framework was intentionally shifted in those 52 work roles to have some that look very IT specific so that it's not necessarily we're saying IT is the entry level position, but it is a natural kind of progression. And, and so that model of you being the applicant who can say, what I already know is relevant to you is something we need to coach more people who go into job interviews with and hopefully get them in, into, that, into that position for that. And so, so that's what I hope happens. Uh, take advantage of that lexicon. And the only other thing is to show that you've taken initiative to do that. Don't come in and say, I'm interested in this, hire me, and, and then pay for my training as opposed to if you walk in and say, look, I've gotten the CISSP, or in my case, I got the CSSLP, Certified Secure Software Lifecycle Professional. It, it, it sets a, a, a filter. It says you've done something on your own. And I think that's what a lot of employers are looking for, not to say we're going to just take raw cloth and train them to be what we want them to be. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So from Thanks. a select, may I? Sure. From a selection perspective, there's a couple things that uh, Navy and DOD are doing, and many of you may be familiar with Defense Language Institute right up in, uh, up in California. What we're doing is actually creating a Defense Cyber Institute where we're creating this uh, a, an aptitude battery that will uh, identify those with a propensity for this particular uh, field, right, and, and uh, a chance for success so that we can screen and then have folks that, that we bring in that folks didn't even know they had a thing for language and they were able to go and successfully navigate Farsi, Persian, you know, Farsi, all of the other uh, languages that were in high demand. So we're doing the same thing. The other side of this is we're creating something, and I don't know if anybody saw the CNO testify before Congress and the, uh, the Intelligence Committee around the need for a cadre, uh, uniform cadre of uh, cyber operators that would be brought in at the, the captain colonel level uh, as uniformed because only shooters can be involved in, only uniformed shooters can be involved in offensive cyber operations. So we have a defensive cyber ops and offensive cyber ops in DOD and offensive cyber ops, we don't talk about it, but it exists. And they can only be uniformed personnel. Only a uniformed person can pull the trigger. And so they're creating a cyber cadre that doesn't have an age limit. It does, so you can come in at 40 or 45 and be a part of it, or you can come in at 19 and be a part of it, depending upon your skills. So qualify, certifiable skills, not a certification, but you're showing, hey, I've been through this training, an entrance exam, and there you are part of this cadre, right? Much like the uh, Uniform Public Health Service, same, same deal.
the uniform cyber service. And that's no, something that's I presented to the IT reform group at, at, with the administration, and they kind of kind of bought off on it. So. But, Very good. And, but by the way, you know, when you say only uniformed officers or uniformed people can be on the cyber attack, a lot of you have heard about hack back and saying we ought to be able to do that. I, mm -hmm. I caution you on that consideration. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you think you're going to hack back at somebody who's coming after you, number one, attribution is very hard in this space. And two, it's a so crime. You don't want to be hacking grandma's computer because her computer was used to do that. But it's kind of like taking a knife into a gunfight. Don't do that. It's just bring in the, the professionals to help you if you think you've, you've got a problem in that space. All right, great. We're moving on to the next question, please. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, this is a question for everyone on the panel. Uh, I just wanted to take it back to the risk management aspect in the previous panel and how in government, what are the incentives, at least on the federal <coughs> level, that you're giving these organizations to you know, get in line with uh, some of these requirements for cybersecurity? Anybody can take that question. Let's start with CDA. So I, I, yeah. You, go, go ahead. So from a, uh, from a classic uh, IT risk management uh, perspective, there are a couple things that we're doing as, and I, I'll say, I won't say incentives, but uh, carrot and stick, we'll say, right? Emphasis on stick. Uh, first of all, uh, as you know, uh, in DOD, they came out and said, by this date, you will uh, have 100% of your systems changed over to a NIST-based risk management framework. It didn't occur. And so what we wound up doing was uh, actually tracking and, and forcing in the Navy, forcing organizational competition, where I'm tracking and saying how many systems are, are in the risk management, also, and using that as them competing against each other. Why aren't we there? Where did, where's the money going? Why aren't we spending the money? Uh, one of the challenges we have, and I think you'll, you'll say the same thing, is that everybody overestimates how much it takes to do risk management, and it, the, the real deal is uh, we're only managing deltas, and once we go to ongoing authorization, then we're really in a, in a position to manage deltas. The other thing that we've done, um, we've created the deadline, we've pushed and created competition, but the other thing we've done is we've, we've forced uh, executives and flag level officers to sign a, a joint risk acceptance and acknowledgement statement and I developed that in the Navy and now it's being pushed uh, up at OSD and what it says is I acknowledge the reputational financial and potential loss of life that this residual risk represents to the Navy enterprise and what what it does is it creates a pucker factor. You can't believe it, right? The executives now want to know, where did you spend the money? Because my name's on the line. If the CISO's the only person signing, the CISO's the only person on the line. But if everyone across the risk acceptance chain is signing, all of a sudden you have partnership in risk acceptance, risk mitigation, risk management, and risk diligence. Good. Accountability. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, so. Uh, let me throw in one real yeah, quick ahead. thing. Is you, the, the, the fact that there's a joint set of risk management framework documents that NIST, DOD, and DHS are all working from, um, it compels yeah. me to say that the next revision of the NICE framework really needs to make sure those are instantiated in, in there so that it, it'll be easy to, to show that training providers are meeting the needs of, of writing the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities. So that's a promise to go back in and see if we need to add a specialty area and some work roles or just beef up the material we already have in there about risk. And, so yeah, sticks and carrots, right? We we've got uh, you know we got statutory requirements on all the agencies to uh, adopt to use the the risk framework at, at the RMF. We've also got an executive order that requires the agencies to use uh, the cybersecurity framework. Um, we've got the statutes at FISMA, uh, which is the Federal Information Security Management Act, requires all the agencies to take a risk-based approach to provide adequate security for their own. Uh, networks requires the CIOs and CISOs to, to, and it's really to the agency head to get delegated to the to the CIO and CISO. Um, OMB is uh, the Office of Management and Budget at the White House is responsible for uh, ensuring that the agencies implement FISMA, mm -hmm. and DHS has the operational side of that uh, oversight, if you will. And so we have a couple of thing, couple of levers that we pull there. Uh, one is that DHS has the authority to issue binding directives on the on the federal civilian government that that are that have the force of law on on the agencies to tell them to do certain things and we've and we've done several 
One that you might be most familiar with is last year we uh, told all the agencies to get a certain antivirus software off of their enterprises, right? Even though they were warned before procurement. <laughs> right. That kind of ties into some of the supply chain work that we're, that we're doing now. Um, another that, that we use is just sort of the naming and shaming, right? The, the, uh, yep. All of the FISMA reporting rolls up into a report card, you know, and, and each agency is listed on this report card as either red, yellow, green. And, you know, th there is a lot of effort that goes into implementing these things mm -hmm. and, and, and securing a federal network. The federal enterprise is varied and, and humongous, to use a technical term, uh, and, and it, it just takes a lot of effort. Uh, we have a lot of legacy systems, and so not everybody's green, right? But there is significant uh, impetus to get to green, because if you don't get to green, you get to go up to the hill, and you get to talk to the congressman who gives you the finger wag and says, you know, you're not green. Why? And, and you know, you better get green. So agency heads and, and political appointees, uh, in certain respects, their jobs are on the line when, when, when these things, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to get fired as, as a political appointee. Um, so that there is, there is an increasing level of, of interest at that, at that, uh, at that level. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other things that we do are uh, things to help the agencies get there, right? So we, we, that's the carrot, right? So one of, those, one of those ways that we help agencies get there is a program called the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program. Essentially what we do is DHS gets, a, gets an appropriated uh, line item every year from Congress uh, to go out and procure tools and sensors. We then take those tools and sensors and in, install them, deploy them in all of the agency networks. Those tools and sensors detect a lot of things, and, and most importantly, they detect where all the configuration uh, vulnerabilities are and where the inherent vulnerabilities in the, uh, the patchable and known vulnerabilities in the hardware and software running on the enterprise are. We take the, all of that vulnerability information, we roll it up to a dashboard that is presented to the CIO and to the agency leadership above that, it, and it, that dashboard prioritizes those vulnerabilities in a, in a way that says to that, that C-suite executive, fix this first, right? And they can roll down the list. This is what's gonna get you to FISMA. This is the highest vulnerability, uh, you know, to FISMA green. This is, what, this is where the highest vulnerabilities uh, exist for you and your enterprise and so forth. And then that, that data is also rolled up from a federal-wide perspective so that the federal CIO has its own dashboard that shows where all the agencies are relative to one another. And so that is a program, and it, it's a, six billion dollar program we're spending a lot of a lot of resources a lot of your tax dollars is going towards securing that federal enterprise with in in a sort of singular way we're, we're trying to buy down risk really that's that's what it, that's what we're after uh, just before we move on to the next question i just want to jump in to talk with the audience a bit about it but you know you hear so much about government you know not making the progress but to me the panel today on government has just talked about so many new things that we haven't heard on any of the other panels or the other conferences that we've been to. Uh, to me, it just shows that we're making some real progress. We are, mm -hmm. but there's there's going to be sure there's still there's, more. There's going to be a caveat mm -hmm. that goes to that, and we've just talked about like what we've done with the supply chain risk management. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in 2016, OMB issued a 130 that had six provisions for supply chain risk management. Mm -hmm. Says you will do this, this, this. Not there yet. Correct. Correct. There, we know there's, just like, and, you'll and, never be there yet, and, but the and, progress we're making is, is really significant. So I there's think. a lot of guidance, and, and, and it's available to everyone. By mm -hmm. the way, the, the stuff that comes out, these practices, it's, it's not just directed at federal agencies, right. uh, even though when OMB says you will mm -hmm. do that, but enterprises sure. out there ought to look at using that as well. Mm -hmm. Again, you're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. Right. Good. Next question. Hi, this, this question is for the whole panel. My name is Freddie. I'm a current student at PCH Tech in the Clifton campus. Um, I currently obtained my uh, Security Plus certification. I'm working on my CSA Plus certification. Uh, as far as I heard corporate, it's going to be tough for me to get jobs in that field because I don't have the experience. Now, as far as government, what would they have for me as an entry-level job because uh, I did a change in careers. I was a culinary chef, and I didn't expect being in this field, which 
to me, became very passionate that I learned about this. I should have learned this maybe 20 years in school would have been a, a different story, right? But as far as me being a 40-year-old male, right. um, I came to realize what can I give to society and what could I offer to my country. Huh. So I, Actually, you're selling yourself short beca because you actually do. You've already shown initiative by getting these credentials. Right. A lot of people haven't done that. So you've already distinguished yourself in the field to do that. And by the way, you can say, well, culinary chef, what has that to do with it? You know that you should not have been using any f tainted food. So you can apply that to say, why are we using tainted cyber elements exactly. you know, from vulnerabilities, weaknesses, stuff? You don't have to know all the nuances about it, but it's probably a, it's using that. Multidisciplinary perspectives are always good in this space. So don't sell yourself short. Okay. Yeah, the, the USA Jobs is, is still not uniformly used across the federal government to describe the cybersecurity jobs in a way that makes it easy to even measure how many are entry level, sure. except if you sort of look at the grade level. You, I, I encourage all students to sort of express that the student journey is your experience level, and so that how did you prepare for those tests, express that. I, when I, even when I'm talking to a kid who's just thinking about going to college and, and I don't know if I want to do cybersecurity, if I find out that they actually enabled the second factor in, in Steam when, in their game app, you know, thing, they did that, or I knew a kid who, who had blocked, he'd done, he had Bitcoin, he had mined some Bitcoin, and I said, how do you know you still have it? And when he described how he knew and how he kept a piece of paper locked in his safe in his house, you've got a cybersecurity mindset that shows experience that might just take you over the edge. There's no promises because oftentimes you don't get past that first paper act with the USA Jobs of submitting yourself. But as you write about yourself, really describe that your journey to get to where you are today is part of your experiential learning. And if, if you can anticipate uh, the tool sets that are similar or parallel, that you can say, I've done that, um, that's a good thing. Another place to go get skills, and, and I don't know if you've done it yet, but competitions, because you're using sometimes real tools and real, vir and, and real virtual environments, expressing your ability to play in that environment is, is a strength that I think let more and more students need to play up. I think, uh, you know, as a hiring manager and set, set across from a bunch of folks, I, I do resume workshops and teaching folks how to use analogous statements of, of skills that are being asked for. And so I would ask, I would, I would encourage you to go to your, your school's uh, resource off person and, and work with them to get your resume uh, to sing. Right, especially around relevant coursework. So in your relevant coursework, you can call out the things that you've done that are specific around those skill sets. The other thing is OPM has a much a little known place where they can tell you exactly what skills and verbiage is needed at every single level for a given OCK field, and that would be 2210 that you're looking at. So I would recommend opm.gov and look up um, uh, 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 what is it, Work, workforce descriptions. And in there, you'll see 2210 and the number of points that each you'll need at every single grade. And it'll tell you, uh, you under supervision I did so and so and so and so, right? And you can use that verbiage to build your resume and make sure that it sings around those task, task items, right? Just because you're not in cyber doesn't mean you're not fit for cyber. You've right. done the work, you've done the quality control, right? Those kinds of things. You've done inspections, you've done all of that. I would use your culinary and your coursework and then make it sing, say, such as, right? I, and that would, that would allow you to cross that bridge much easier. So are, are you still working in the culinary field? No. No. Okay. So even if you're not, um, right and join join follow the RCISC, the retail cyber information sharing center and see what they post and start going you know I can talk about this with anybody and then you, you actually could walk right back into your old industry and say I, I, I you know I'm here to help so I, and by the way one of the best guys I know in cybersecurity is the vice president of one of the companies was a chef so I was actually a chef too before yeah. <laughs> so what did you used okay. to do? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got time for one last question, and that'll be Hi, it. Hi, uh, my name is Mickey. I'm also a student so working off this question. Um, how important are, or how important is it to develop 
a deep understanding of computer science and like mathematics in the world of like information security. So like if you wanted to be like a CISO or something, how important is it to know like operating like operating systems at like a deep down level, like learning assembly code or like data structures or like calculus or linear algebra? So right. so, so just recently there's a new cybersecurity curriculum guidance document that ACM and IEEE put out, and the definition of cybersecurity in their mind, and it's a good one. It's a computing-based discipline involving technology, people, information, and processes to enable assured operations in the context of adversaries. And I'll just stop there, there's more. But you heard the word computing-based. So anybody who walks in with as much understanding of computing-based things is gonna be in a better is gonna be in a better position to hold a conversation. Now, if you walk in there and you're not able to express to somebody that your understanding of that is relevant, then, then you haven't quite done the homework and used your soft skills of, of communication. But it, it will never damage your ability to get a job if you're able to demonstrate that you, you can do things with code and you can understand that uh, you know the, 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 these these chips and memory systems and all this stuff is 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 going to be you know there is a, a strong need to understand that to a, a, a better depth, and each organization will will, will push you in that space if they, if you show that aptitude. Bill, you you uh, you said earlier though that the IT you know some of the basic IT is still foundational to this particular field. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank every panel member for the contributions you've made and give you a hand. We can talk about it all day.